Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. I am Janine Turner. Welcome to our show, Constitutional Chats. I am founder and co-president of Constituting America, and I'm also an actress, but you can find all that at JaneTurner.com. But meanwhile, today I'm, I'm founder and co-president of Constituting America, as I am every day, <laughs> not just today. And we're thrilled that you're with us. Come on in. We have a great show. We are going to be talking about the little signer, little known signers of the declaration, not little signers of the declaration, little known signers of the declaration. And today is Roger Sherman. We've all sort of heard that name, but how much do we really know about Roger Sherman? And we have a special guest expert with us today, Tom Han. So it's going to be a fantastic show. We're thrilled that you're joining us. I'm going to, we're going to throw up a little poll at the top here to let us know so we can gear our conversation toward you. Let us know if you're an elementary school student, middle school student, high school student, grandparent, parent, teacher, donor, fan, friend, let us know. You can scroll up and down there. I am up and let us know. And that helps us um, know how to focus our show today for you. And uh, while we're doing that, I'm gonna introduce Aubrey. Um, just Aubrey is our director of media. And since we're dealing with media right now, I wanted to introduce Aubrey. Aubrey is one of our signers, uh, signers, one of our winners of our contest, the We the Future contest. And we're thrilled she's the media director for Constitution America. We're thrilled she's with us. She, we love to brag that she's the middle of seven children. And uh, she is a, are you, not quite a graduate yet, I don't believe, of Brigham Young University. And she oh, aspired, yeah. Yeah, aspired to be an athletic coach. So um, Aubrey, you're terrific. You're just awesome. Say hello for us and let us see your face as you tell us the statistics here. Yes, hello everyone. So happy to be here with you, Janine. Um, so I will share the statistics for everyone on the show today. Our largest group is 25% of parent and grandparents with children. And then we have 21% fans. We have 17% family and another 17% friends. And then we're excited to have 4% middle and high school students and 4% elementary school students. So we're glad that all of you are here today. Yes, we are. Thank you, Aubrey. The captain with seven children was the fierce a lot of that. Oh, I'm okay. I always have to sing some music, right? Aubrey? Yes, I love it. <laughs> All right. Middle of seven children. We just think that's fantastic. Okay. Uh, I'm going to introduce Kathy Gillespie, co president of Constituting America. We'd like to talk about. Uh, an eagle has two wings, a right wing and a left wing to fly. And without Kathy, I'd just be flapping around. And it's also you, our donors, who are the wind beneath our wings. So Kathy's going to introduce our donors today. Kathy was a, uh, I think we have a photo of Kathy too, beautiful photo. Kathy was the, uh, was a chief of staff on the Hill for decades. And if you want anything done, or if you want to know, get to anybody, Kathy is your person. I've never known a more connected person and a more diligent, hardworking person in my life. Um, and she's also one of the few select citizens across the entire country to have been chosen, only 17, to be on the, uh, to be one of the private citizens on the board of the Semi-Quincentennial Commission, planning our 250th birthday for America. So we're, that's quite prestigious and we're very proud of Kathy. And uh, what else, Kathy? Kathy was the, what was your official position with the White House Fellows? She was, she was in I charge was a, of the White House Fellows. No, no, I wasn't what in was charge. I was just a commissioner. I was a commissioner there of you the go. White House Fellows Commission. Commissioner. I know she invited me to speak and I didn't get to do it, but commissioner with the White House Fellows. You might want to tell us what a White House Fellow is. You never really know. And I never found out how your father-in-law got his knee shot off uh, during the war. I'm really curious about that too. But anyway, uh, Kathy Gillespie, say hello. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Janine, for that great introduction, and thank you for your leadership of Constituting America. It's a great blessing to me to be able to work with you every day in promoting the United States Constitution. Um, 
As far as the White House Fellows goes, I would encourage anyone uh, who's an active citizen to go uh, to the White House Fellows uh, organization, just Google White House Fellows and apply. It's a great program established in the 1960s by President Lyndon B. Johnson. We're uh, about maybe 20 or so, or 20 to 30 fellows are, are selected every year, and you get placed in different departments and agencies across the government. And uh, the, the fellows learn so much about the United States government, and then they take that knowledge back to their communities and continue uh, in, in their many leadership roles. And we have so many famous and uh, successful elected officials who have been White House fellows in the past. I think Elaine Chao, who was Department of Transportation Secretary, was a White House fellow. My old boss, Congressman Joe Barton, was a White House fellow and just, you know, many more. So um, anyway, check them out. It's a great program. Uh, we want to thank our very special sponsor today, Mr. Ken Reeder of Ohio. And Ken is a longtime supporter of Constituting America, uh, is in the audience on many of our chats. And Ken uh, got really involved with this, especially when we began speaking in the Ohio schools a few years ago. And Tova most recently spoke at the Ohio Council of the Social Studies, uh, I think this past summer to, to over 200 teachers. So we've been uh, very active in Ohio with our school speaking program. And Mr. Reader, we just thank you so much for your uh, Zoom sponsorship today and all you do to help us uh, deliver our constitution education programs. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for your donation. We're thrilled, so thrilled. You are the wind beneath our wings. And we have a cool program coming up, by the way, for the Declaration of Independence weekend. Uh, next Tuesday, we are going to be having a movie night where we are airing all of our PSA, not all, but many of our PSAs and movies. And we would love for you to join us. So it starts next Tuesday. We'll come back to that and talk about that a little bit more. All right, now I'm going to introduce Tova Love Kaplan, the extraordinary Tova Love Kaplan. Tova Love Kaplan has just been such a such a cornerstone for constituting America. And man, I think of all the things that you have done to represent constituting America. When I heard that you you worked on that last project that Kathy mentioned, and you've done so many amazing things with us, and we're just so proud of you and proud that. You have chosen to work with us and be a part of our organization. Tova has won our contest three times, the We the Future contest, best PSA, best entrepreneurial marketing plan in eighth grade, I might add, and best uh, app, which we should have up very shortly. And when you see it, you will know that it was created by the extraordinary Tova Love Kaplan. Tova is only a junior in high school. I think we've noticed that she was in eighth grade. And uh, but she's going on 30 years old here, ready to take on the world. She's our direct national youth director of our youth board, which she runs like a top CEO of a 100 top 100 company. She's truly, truly as she speaks three languages. And you're going to see Tova as either an ambassador to to the U.N., a secretary of state or the president, whatever she wants to be, Tova will accomplish. Tova, I'm not just saying that I really mean it. <clears throat> Welcome. to the show. Thank you so much, Janine. I always, you know, appreciate you and everything, and I wouldn't be anywhere near where I am today without you and Kathy and Constituting America. So, you know, this organization really, really does great work. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to talk about this and to continue the series. So, and thank you to our sponsor. Fantastic. All righty. Tell us the three languages you speak again. Um, I speak, so other than English, I'm learning um, Latin, French, Hebrew, and Arabic. Four! My gosh. You're the next John Quincy Adams. That's who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I love John Quincy Adams. Lots of great stories there, which I'm sure Tom Hand knows is the expert. We're getting to our guests. In just okay, Jewel and Jorn Gilbert, they are also equally as extraordinary. They're new to our show. We think they're fantastic. They bring such a level of class and dignity to our show. Jewel Gilbert is executive producer and Jordan Gilbert is operations director of Sing for America, which is a family-based company that the brothers co-founded. Sing for America seeks to show the art of truth and light through live performance. Both are proud we the future contest winners. Well, we're happy to hear that because we are proud of them. Um, Sing for America is an actor-run theater company which specializes in semi-professional musicals private training in the arts, school drama solutions, I'd love to hear what those are, and public entertainment events, all while revealing a colorblind world stage. 
Jewel and Jordan are graduates of Moravian College, which they, where they each earned a BA in musical performance and dramatic production. We're so thrilled to have both of you grace our stage today. Hello, Jewel and Jordan Gilbert. Oh, where'd they go? <laughs> well, sorry, Jewel keeps hitting the wrong <laughs> button today. Because <laughs> we flip sides. <laughs> but Janine, finally, the school drama solutions, every time you say that, you say, I want to hear what that is. And I don't think I've ever said it. And basically, it's just that when a school district doesn't, or a school itself, doesn't have the money to have the program that we want to have, then we fill the gap, not with money, but with our services. So whether we put on an entire show with the kids or whether we augment what they have in place, or sometimes they don't have an arts program at all. And it runs only through us as a club after school or something like that. There's been in school model, out of school assembly, whole musical where we've produced it, or we've been there the whole year, been there for a week, a month. So it really, runs the gamut, but it's all different kinds of things like that, which have to do with either they don't have a dedicated teacher, they do, but they don't have money, or they have the money in the program and a dedicated teacher, but they just want more. Well, okay, I'm impressed. Mr. Tom Hand, are you not impressed with these four I young? Am. Yes. Rising nice young generations we have, the rising generation we have here. Okay, okay. I'm gonna introduce the extraordinary Tom Hand. Are you ready for this drum roll, please? I'm sure we have a <laughs> wonderful photo of Mr. Tom Hand to put up to. There we go. There we go. All hey. right. Yay, there he is. <laughs> okay, Tom Hand. Let me tell you all about Tom Hand. Tom Hand is the creator and publisher of Americana Corner. You gotta check this out. A site he started in 2020. Tom is a West Point graduate, class of 1982, who created Gilman Cheese Corporate, the Gilman Cheese Corporation after leaving the military. Upon serving his company, Tom retired and moved to Georgia. Tom, after selling, did I say selling or did I say something else? Anyway, upon selling his company, Tom retired and moved to Georgia. Tom spends most of his time writing for Americana Corner and helping charities with a focus on early America. Tom served on the board of trustees for the American, serves on the board of trustees for the American Battlefield Trust and the National Park Foundation's National Council. He enjoys reading books on American history, yes, me too, and classic novels, as well as gardening, playing his guitar and singing, and traveling the byways and waterways of America. Oh, so cool. We encourage you to go to Tom's website, Americana.com, Americana AmericanaCorner.com, AmericanaCorner.com, and follow him on Facebook and Instagram. Just type in Americana Corner to find him. We want to give a special thanks to Tom for writing nine out of our 90 essays this year on our 90-day study about the Declaration of Independence of Little Known Signers and for his, in the Declaration of Independence, and for his sponsorship of our 90-day essay project. Oh, and that's going so well with his sponsorship. He wouldn't believe the advancements our 90 day studies making because of Tom Hand, who's I guess we should say is the wind beneath our 90 day studies. Um, <laughs> and, our, um, and he's also sponsoring our upcoming winter trip, which is going to be happening in September in DC with all of our winners from the contest. So we thank you so, so much. And I might close with my introduction and saying that Mr. Tom Hand also wrote the essay on Roger Sherman. We did. Today. Right. And so we're thrilled you're with us. I know it took a while to get to you here. It's a typical 15 minute introduction of everybody, yeah. but, oh, tell me what your favorite classic novels are. Let's start with that. And then we'll get to Roger Sherman. Just a few, well, just a few. I, uh, I love Jane Eyre. Uh, uh, I love all Charles Dickens. Uh, Thackeray is great. Uh, do you have a favorite uh, classical novel? I like Dostoevsky. Yes, I have a half a dozen of his. Which is your favorite? <laughs> I like uh, Crime and Punishment. I love Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. Uh, or anything about a philosopher. Yeah, great. It was great. Great. To Tova just held up a book. Tova, what was your book? Oh, I'm trying to knock out some classics this summer, so I'm reading Pride and Prejudice right now. It's very yeah. Oh, Jane, who doesn't love Jane, Jane Austen. Austen. Yes. Love I have all Austen. seven of her novels are fantastic. Mm -hmm. Love and Friendship is on uh, Amer uh, Amazon Prime right now. I would recommend everybody watch oh, that. Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay. <laughs> well, here <laughs> we sure are. I excited about this conversation, but I, th I think you're here to hear about <laughs> Roger Sherman. So here we go. Mr. Here we John go. Thank well, yeah. Thanks, Janine, for having me on. I really appreciate it. 
Um, Roger Sherman. Now, Roger Sherman is one of those uh, relatively little known uh, signers, founding fathers, but in my estimation, other than George Washington, the case could be made that Roger Sherman is the founding father in terms of his impact on America. He's the only man who attended the Stamp Act Congress, the first Continental Congress, the second Continental Congress, and the Philadelphia Convention, which we call the Constitutional Convention. He's also the only man who signed the uh, petition to the king, the Articles of Association, the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and the Constitution. He's the only one. Adams didn't do it. Madison didn't do it. Franklin didn't do it. Monroe, none of those guys. But Roger Sherman did, and yet we know almost nothing about Roger Sherman. Um, he was born in humble circumstances, like so many great men are. Uh, his father was a small farmer who in the winter was a cord waner, which is a shoemaker. And he did that, uh, and Roger helped him along with his, uh, his studies. Roger's formal schooling was very limited. You know, he was a poor kid, and he had a formal education only to about age 10. And after that, he read everything he could get. His father had a small library, but he borrowed books whenever he could. And he taught himself as much as he could. But his life was to be a small farmer and a shoemaker. His father passed away when Roger was 19, uh, leaving Roger to take care of his widowed mother and his six younger siblings. So he ran the farm, took care of the family, and, but he wanted to do more. And so he started studying mathematics on his own. And uh, by the time he was 24, five years later, he became the surveyor for New Haven County, all this on his own. But he also wanted to be a lawyer. And so he started studying uh, the law. Once again, while he's a surveyor, running the small farm, supporting his family still, he starts studying, but he has no law books. So he borrows as many law books as he can. And by the time he's 33 years old, he passes the bar in Connecticut. That's 1754. Within one year, he had 125 cases. I mean, this guy was successful. He was smart. He was hardworking. He was making it all happen on his own. By 1765, when the first uh, big Congress in America uh, was convened, the Stamp Act Congress, Roger Sherman, this farmer's son, this self-educated man, um, was selected as a delegate from Connecticut to the Stamp Act Congress. Nine years later, in 1774, but by now he's been a justice of the peace, he's been uh, a uh, county magistrate, and he's been a delegate to the General Assembly in Connecticut. And once again, this is with no formal schooling past age 10. So anyway, he's selected to the first Continental Congress in 1774 as one of uh, Connecticut's three delegates. He signs the petition to the king, which was basically a list of grievances explaining what was going wrong in the colonies and, and from our perspective. And then he signed the Articles of Association, also sometimes called the Continental Association, which was our first concerted effort to try to, to group together and fight back against parliament. And that was the Articles of Association. One year forward from that, he uh, was selected to attend the Second Continental Congress. And while there, uh, now remember, there's uh, 56 signers, but there are more delegates than that that didn't sign. And so he's one of about 80 guys there. And he was so impressive that he was one of five guys selected to the committee to write the Declaration of Independence. Now, Jefferson gets all the credit. I understand that. But it was a committee that kind of worked on it and drafted it. And that committee was a bunch of heavy hitters. It was Jefferson, John Adams, Ben Franklin, we all know those guys, Roger Living or Robert Livingston, and who else? Roger Sherman. No one remembers Roger Sherman, but he was instrumental in that. And then uh, 
They get the declaration signed and approved. A year later, they start to pass the Articles of Confederation because they needed a form of government to consolidate everybody. And every colony got one representative. Well, who do you think Connecticut picked? Roger Sherman. So he's instrumental in writing the Articles of Confederation, our first constitution. So now you fast forward uh, to 1787, the great year of our constitution. The delegates assemble and they run into an issue right away because there's big states like Virginia and there's small states like New Jersey. And Virginia comes up with something called the Virginia Plan. And New Jersey comes up with something called the New Jersey Plan. Well, the Virginia Plan was one house all based on population. Now, who do you think that favored? Virginia, obviously. New Jersey, a small state at that time, wanted equal representation. If you were a colony, you got one guy or two guys or whatever, and that was it. Everybody's equal. And so the Constitutional Convention was in danger of shutting down if something wasn't done. And so Roger Sherman steps up and he proposes what's come down to us through history as the Great Compromise of 1787, also called the Sherman Compromise, where he said, let's work this out. Why don't we have one upper house, the Senate, that has equal representation and a lower house, the House of Representatives, that has proportional representation based on population. And it passed. And that's the system that we now enjoy in Washington. And the only change, the only difference was when that compromise was enacted, senators were not elected by the people. They were appointed by state legislatures back home. It wasn't until the 17th Amendment in 1912, it was passed and ratified in 1913 that senators were actually elected. Prior to that, if you were a senator, you were nominated and appointed by your state legislature. So, so here's a guy, he's a self-made man, does it all on his own. He's a justice of the peace, he's a judge, he's a, and, and at the end of his career, after all this stuff, he served in the first House of Representatives ever. Two years later, he was in the United States Senate. And so he did, he checks every box you can imagine except the big one. He wasn't in the Oval Office. And so you ask, well, why isn't Roger Sherman remembered? Well, maybe that's why, I don't know for sure, but you take a look at the accomplishments of anybody else. And Roger Sherman's, with the exception of George Washington, who truly is the indispensable man, Roger Sherman ranks right up there and people just don't know about him. So I'll get off my Roger Sherman soapbox and answer questions that you might have. That, that was that was very, very, very interesting. Thank you for, for that. I mean, gosh, I like to think I know a lot, but I didn't know all that. <laughs> that's what's so great about, that's what's so wonderful about constituting America. You know, Kathy and I created something that we enjoy and love and that we can learn as we go along. So it's, it's, it's well, Eugene, this, this, What you're doing here is making a difference and that's all any of us can do. We can just do that little thing to help out. True, true. And understanding our history is, yep. is, 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 that's why the study is technically 90 day, 90 and 90 equals 180. History holds the key, key to the future. You know, looking back yep. 180 at the history, why it's so important for today. Yep. Um, can you drive for us? I want to toss it, <laughs> excuse me, to the rest of the team. But what are you saying though? Stand back Congress? What are you calling that? Oh, the Stamp Act Congress. Stamp. Okay, I thought you were saying stand back Congress. And I'm like, I've never heard of the stand back Congress. <laughs> no, that, no, I haven't heard of that one either. <laughs> all, right, all right, so it's the stand, no, the stand back. back Congress. I'm sorry, I was, I was probably speaking too fast, but that was in 1765. Uh, uh, it's probably my it hearing, was, go ahead. And it was uh, convened to uh, push back against the Stamp Act, which parliament had enacted in 1765. Okay, so now we know Stamp Act. Yes, I think many of us have heard that. So, so let's just walk through the signings again. There, the first one was the Stamp Act. Well, there wasn't anything to sign there. There was a meeting. They kind of convened okay. and talked about what they were going to do. But the, the five things that he signed, the five key things, 
The first one was a petition to the king. And the petition to the king was a letter stating the, col the colonists' grievances with parliament, not with the king. And that's why they sent it to the king, because you, know, you have to have an ally, right? And you divide and conquer. And so the colonists sent a letter to the king saying, we know that you're not the problem. The problem is those other guys in parliament. And can you talk to them for us and get these things taken back, this repealed? It didn't work. But that was- What year we, was that? That was, what uh, year was 1774. That? Okay. And also in 1774 was the Articles of Association. And some people call it the Continental Association because it was the first time that the colonies on the continent associated together to make something happen. That something was a boycott on British goods. Remember the, the way that system used to work was the colonies were needed to provide raw materials for the mother country. The mother country would produce those things and then send them back to us and sell them to us. And so we had no manufacturers. We had no you know, factories making things back then. We make the raw material, we ship it over to England because they didn't have the raw materials. They would produce it and they'd have a natural home for their finished goods. And that was us. And it kind of worked great from their perspective, but you know, we weren't, but we were dependent on the mother country, on, on England. And anyway, uh, what we decided to do was rather than declare war right away, we said, well, let's see if we can pressure them economically. And so <clears throat> they implemented this boycott on all British goods. And uh, you know, honestly, neither thing resonated that well in England. Uh, the, the king ignored our petition and parliament, um, you know, they didn't like the boycott, but it didn't bother them as much as it bothered the, uh, the merchants. You know, if, if it's costing you money, you're gonna be bothered by it. Parliament was still getting their salaries. They didn't care that much, but they got, they cared enough with the merchants to get the act rescinded. And so, um, Things got a little bit better, but then 1770. If, if I can interject there for two seconds, what's yep. interesting about that to me is the sacrifice the colonists made, because yep. by saying no to to the goods, yep. think of everything that they lost that with no ability to manufacture really here on their own. That's a huge. That's not just saying, oh, we're mad at the French don't drink, you know, this particular French mm -hmm. wine. This was. This was giving up on having their needs manufactured and sent back to them. That was a big, big, big sacrifice. It was a big deal. And, and we remember that, uh, you know, there were guys that obviously went and fought in the wars and the battles, but, uh, you know, the, the home life, it, it was tough, you know, to not have the, the basic things, cloth. They made their own dresses and stuff. They didn't have that, you know. And so, you know, so the woman of the house, so to speak, had to do her thing and it, it, it was tough. <clears throat> but they wanted con or uh, parliament to know that they, they meant business. Um, and so anyway, that was a continental association or the articles mm -hmm. of association. And they overturned that they over. Well, and then, and then the, uh, the boycott was largely rescinded because the merchants told the, uh, um, the uh, uh, parliament, they had to back off because they, they were, it was costing them too much money. Mm -hmm. And how long did that last? How long did that boycott last? I you don't know. know. That's, I don't know. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Um, and, and, okay. Well, so what was next? Go ahead. Oh, oh, that's okay. And then so 1775 comes along and then they have Lexington and Concord and, and uh, they'd already planned on having the second Continental Congress convening. And so they did that. They met. Um, and finally, in 1776 is when they wrote the Declaration of Independence. And uh, as I said, Roger Sherman was on the committee of five that actually drafted it. Uh, uh, Jefferson gets all the credit. Um, you know, and if you watch the uh, John Adams movie, uh, John Adams and uh, Ben Franklin are sitting in the same room with Jefferson, like they're the committee, but Livingston and uh, Sherman aren't anywhere on the screen. And I think there's a little bit of uh, you know Hollywood doing what they want to do, but. Uh, yeah, I think you're talking about that HBO series, which really I didn't think was a, a great representation. But in oh. 1776, the musical, which I always talk about around July 4th. Okay. It was done in the 1970s. 17, have you seen it? 
1776. Oh, it's the best John Adams ever. It's a it's wonderful, but they do represent oh. Roger Sherman. Okay, do All right, good. All right. Yeah, check it out. Okay, go ahead. So I want to toss this over to We have the petition to the king, he signed the Articles of Association, and then it's yeah. next Declaration is of Independence. The Declaration of Independence, and then the Articles of Confederation, and then the Constitution. That's great. That's awesome. Okay, well, thanks for walking through that with us again. He really is a, a pivotal person in our career. Our you mean, career. If you just if you put up a list of of what he did, and you put up a list of what Jefferson did and Adams and these other guys, and you didn't put any names up there, you you'd say, "Wow, who's this guy?" And so, anyway, it's um, yeah, he's quite a guy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pass it on to Tova. Hi, Tova. Sounds great. Um, thank you so much. This is just fascinating. I can't believe I was never taught about him in school. Um, like other than a background name. <laughs> yeah. So I'm very glad to be here. Um, okay, so I know we talk about, you know, oh, he signed this and he signed this and he signed this, but I think what we don't realize is like or what the gravity of like each thing he signed. It's like it's not just you know, signing a contract, like it was a life and death situation a lot of times, like for the Declaration of Independence, you could get executed for treason for signing it. So it was like just so monumentous. So could you just talk about like, you know, the things he signed and the rooms he was in and, and like the gravity of it um, and why that was just so important to like help that that message. Thing. Yeah, thank you, Tova. You know, that, you guys are a great point, Tova. Um, you know, we, we forget that these uh, the politicians that sign these things and, uh, and the signers, um, they were men of property. And so it wasn't like they had nothing to lose. And as you point out, Tova, <clears throat> when they signed their name, they were committing an act of treason. And back then, <clears throat> treason ended up in, in death. And, and they were living in British America with British troops and British officials and and yet they took those steps because they felt strongly about um, our rights as Englishmen. Remember that, as Englishmen. Uh, the, the, uh, the people forget the founders didn't necessarily, they weren't these crazy radicals that simply wanted to separate and go on their own way. They took steps in the progression to independence. They, they sent a petition to the king. They tried to boycott. There was nothing violent about a boycott. They tried that. They tried different things. Nothing seemed to work. And then, of course, the violence erupted at Lexington and Concord. But um, you're right, Tova. These people were sacrificing their life, uh, their livelihood, and not just for them, you know, their loved ones. It wasn't like the king was going to say, okay, uh, Sherman, you're in trouble, but your, your wife and your 15 kids, he had 15 kids, by the way, um, uh, you can, you can be fine and, and your brothers and they can go their own way. It wasn't like that. And so they were taking a lot into their own hands and, and they, they didn't do it easily. Uh, John Dickinson, another great founding father who's not remembered because he refused to sign the Declaration of Independence uh, was another man who fought against that sort of thing. He just, and he felt like we still hadn't gone far enough in our conciliatory measures before we signed the Declaration of Independence. But there are a lot of people the wealthiest men in America were the guys that signed these documents. You know, Ben Franklin, another guy. Uh, they they risked it all, and so uh, you know, thanks for, for bringing that up, Tova. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then you know, I think it's really interesting that Roger Sherman came from very you know modest means, standing alongside men like Jefferson and Washington, right. who came from so much wealth and and that right. like breeding and aristocracy was such a part of their character. So um, how did his how does his origins kind of shape who he became as a person? And then did it ever cause, to your knowledge, any conflicts or any tensions between um, other founding fathers who came from a very different background? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, but answer the last question first. No, it didn't cause any conflicts. In fact, uh, um, Jefferson uh, made a quote one time uh, that uh, when he was pointing out different people in the, uh, in the assembly that were significant. He said, there's Roger Sherman. He's never said a silly thing in his life. 
Um, and uh, um, another quote um, was that uh, uh, one of uh, Fisher Ames from Massachusetts famously said that uh, if, um, if I'm not in attendance and you need me to vote, vote whatever way Roger Sherman says, because if he's voting, it's right. And, but he was a man of modest circumstances. You know, he was, he was somewhat similar in some ways to George Washington in his, his, he was solid, but not brilliant. He was honest and trustworthy, not devious. Um, he was rock steady instead of volatile. All the great things that Washington had, except of course, Washington was born into wealth. Um, in some ways, he was very similar to Ben Franklin. You know, Ben Franklin ran away from home at, I don't know, at 14 or something, and, um, and made it all on his own. And by age 48, he was one of the wealthiest guys in America and retired as a wealthy printer. And so Ben Franklin's a self-made man, Roger Sherman a self-made man. And so, uh, but he was so highly respected. Uh, he was named to every important committee in every assembly he attended. Uh, the Committee of Five, uh, the Committee of 13 to draft the Articles of Confederation, and then finally, the Great Compromise of 1787 crafted by Roger Sherman. And so he was not looked down upon at all. He was highly revered. Um, you know, Tova, he was one of those guys that's just rock steady that you, every organization has to have. They don't have the flash. They don't have the name power, but they get things done. And that, that was Roger Sherman. Amazing. I mean, in many ways, he seems to really embody the American dream, even you know, before there was an America, um, yeah. you know, someone coming from modest means and just through their own character and abilities rising up and then giving back to the country. I think that's really amazing. Um, and so I'm wondering, how did he uh, how did he get swept up in the American Revolution and in the ideals of independence? Um, was he always you know, in support of breaking away from England or, or what was the progression of his views on independence? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, he was raised in a, a Judeo-Christian household where they had traditional values, you know, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, he didn't, uh, his argument with Parliament, as I read about Roger Sherman, doesn't seem to be focused on uh, what we term natural rights, you know, uh, the, the right to freedom of religion and, and uh, the um, freedom of expression, those kind of things. He, he supported those things, but <clears throat> from what I've read, he seemed most troubled by the, uh, the legal issues. He was a brilliant uh, um, lawyer, and uh, which is why he was a judge and a justice of the peace and so many other things. But he was troubled by what he saw as a violation of parliament's legal rights. You know, to, to tax without representation. He just saw it as, as a problem. And he was a very, um, he was an ardent patriot, but not a flag waver. He wasn't a guy that said that he was like a Sons of Liberty, willing to burn down somebody's house. He wasn't one of those guys. <clears throat> he simply said, look, legally, you can't do what you're doing. And if you continue on this path, we have to take some steps. And so that was really his, his point of view, I think. Well, thank you so much. I'll, I'll pass it on so I don't hog the time, but I really appreciate it. Seems like a such an important man who we really should learn more about. Yeah, thanks, Tova. <clears throat> thank you, Tova. And you know, as I toss this, uh, always insightful questions from Tova, right? She's, she always gets the great question. We, we did a whole little <laughs> promotional piece where Kathy and I asked, eh, but Tova, great question. Great question, Tova, great question. Um, it was a fun little promotion. Um, uh, but, but as I toss to Jewel and Jorn, I, I do want to mention that I, what I think is his greatest contribution is the Sherman Compromise. What, I mean, yes. what would we be without that? And that was truly awesome. So Jewel and Jorn, I don't want to take up any more of your time. You've got 10 minutes and then we'll toss it to Kathy. All right. Sounds good. Well, first, I want to start by saying thank you for sharing everything about Roger Sherman with us. It's very, very insightful. Sure. and you definitely made the information interesting. You know, oftentimes Thank you can hear, hear these, these historical facts and kind of just nod your head and say, oh, yay, good for, good for him. But uh, I you know, brought to, some life to I it. I didn't have to take a sip yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to know what were, 
what were his original ambitions? Was it in his sights to reach the political parties and uh, go into that world? Or was it just the natural, or was that more of a natural line of his life? You know, he became a lawyer, saw yeah. the issue of parliament and was forced into politics almost. That's a great question, John. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> no, he was, uh, he was, as I said, born in a modest circumstances. <clears throat> I think, you know, when you're born into that sort of um, setting, and you don't dream as big sometimes as people that are closer to the top. Mm -hmm. um, he was taking care of his, his family like he should. And, uh, <clears throat> but he, he had an inquisitive mind. And so he wanted to do more and he started studying and he realized he grasped things well. Um, and so um, mathematics was interesting to him. Uh, mathematics was a precursor to being a surveyor which interestingly is how George Washington got his start in business as a surveyor. Hmm. Um, and so he did that and he also published almanacs, the newspapers of his era, uh, because he enjoyed astronomy as well. And he also taught himself that. And he was going down that path, uh, Jordan, and I think he was happy in that life. Um, but he had, because of his ability, several neighbors asked him to prepare documents for a court for them. And an attorney <laughs> said, holy cow, this is pretty good stuff. Um, you ever thought about being an attorney? And uh, it sparked that interest. And so he started studying and, uh, and borrowed books here and there. Never had a, a mentor, if you will. <clears throat> and so he kind of drifted into being an attorney. Um, and because he was so highly regarded, uh, he was appointed to all these positions of, of prominence in Connecticut, including appointments to these different Congresses. And so it wasn't like he campaigned for these things like some, some people did. Uh, you know, every time joined, he was selected by the people because of his ability. And so no, I don't think he had any intention to do all these things. But you know, the other thing that's amazing with him is country always came first. You know, he sacrificed his law practice because Con uh, Connecticut said, you have to go to Philadelphia. Mm. He said, okay, I'll do it. And so he always sacrificed. America always came first. And so he didn't really want that, but he did it because I think he felt duty bound to do it. Mm. Wow. Okay. And that kind of runs into what I was thinking about, you know, all of those, all of those appointments you have to leave leave your family and that's a lot of time forced to spend away left his wife at home with 15 kids that's um <laughs> something and i've really noticed that during this series of little known founders they are extremely extremely popular among their peers and in their state because you know uh for the for the george washington's his appointments must have been more uh assumed yep. per se yep but you know guys like sherman and last week we talked about uh benjamin rush they were just well well loved very beloved men that chose their country yeah um and i just think it's very 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 insightful to see to see what our what the most important and crucial signers were picked for you know, yep. because the, the states had to see them as valuable additions to these congresses, to these, um, you know, meetings. That's a great point. You know, the, uh, these guys were popular. You're right. It, it wasn't like they went out campaigning and they had TV ads and <laughs> they could paint a false picture for, they, they were chosen because people respected them. <clears throat> and, you know, some people have differences of opinion, but, um, it's interesting how people with differences of, of opinion back then were able to get past it and, and find some common ground in which to work. And uh, it's a great example to set for all of us, isn't it? Yes, it is. So what were, what were his differences of opinion uh, with the other founders? What was Sherman's political background? Um, at <clears throat> bigger government to smaller government, um, what was he, was he very, very federalist or did he have misgivings about federalism he did that's a great question thank you for asking that yeah he uh 
<clears throat> he wasn't um, a big fan of a strong executive. Um, you know, they had, he had seen too much of uh, the king. So he worried a little bit about the new constitution giving uh, too much power uh, to one person. <clears throat> um, he was uh, initially opposed to George Washington being named as the, the army of the uh, Continental Army commander. Um, not because he didn't like George Washington, but because almost all the troops that was going to be declared as the Continental Army were from New England. And he felt a New Englander should be named. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it, Sherman was a guy who put his uh, opinion forward and then uh, listened. And if it wasn't adopted, <clears throat> if his point of view wasn't adopted, he went with what was uh, necessary for the, uh, for the country. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit. I'm not used to these long talks. <laughs> Thank you. You have a great setup, though, I have to say. It was a great setup. <laughs> Thanks. I remind you in that, that um, the seamless picture in the back is awesome. I've been looking at it. But do you know, do you know what his philosophical underpinnings were for his politics? Um, I know you mentioned that it wasn't as much a natural rights issue when he declared, um, mm -hmm. when he wrote about why um, um, against the Stamp Act against parliament, things like that. So do you know what were his motivating foundational beliefs? Yeah, it, it, you know, honestly, <clears throat> Jewel, it, it seemed like it was more legal than uh, moral. Um, if I may, you know, the, the, the natural rights argument tends to be a bit of a moral argument. You know, we have a right to do this and a right to do that. Yeah. Um, I've read a lot on Roger Sherman. I haven't seen a lot of the, uh, his quotes talking about that. Um, he was very troubled by what he saw as a, uh, an overreach of, uh, of parliament and, and, and the king. Um, and so to answer your question, I think philosophically, um, <clears throat> he felt like it wasn't legally right to do what they were doing and he, and he wanted that fixed. But um, <clears throat> I didn't get the sense that he had, a, you know, a, he, was, he was a very Christian man, uh, a very moral man. Um, no one could find any fault with him personally, but it, it's interesting, Jewel. He, I never found anything where he, he preached to somebody, you know, you should be a better person. You should do this better. He wasn't one of those kind of guys. He just set the example. And I think he kind of hoped people would follow his example, which there's probably a lesson in that too. Yeah. Getting back to the, to the politics question, if you had to put him towards one of the other founders politically, who do you think he was most aligned with? Someone that um, mm -hmm. he, John he Adams. doesn't understand. Okay. Yeah, so John right. Adams. You know, you know, I, um, <clears throat> if I had to give a second talk, <clears throat> I would ask to talk about John Adams because there's another guy who nobody knows about. You know, he doesn't have a monument on the mall in D.C. Or a Jefferson musical. has one. <laughs> I mean, Washington, obviously, he's special, but um, John Adams, um, I'm not going to talk about John Adams because I'll get on a soapbox about that, but um, John so Adams. Will, just, so will Janine. Oh, okay. Yes. okay. <laughs> I'm a huge John Adams fan, Jules, there you go. correct. So, um, <laughs> we, we should just do a whole show on John Adams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they were both New England guys. Um, they both were close to the earth. Um, they were both uh, devoted to their family. <clears throat> they 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 didn't have any moral issues or ethical issues. They were just rock solid guys. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so I think John Adams. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna turn over to the audience questions here. Great, and before we do, I just wanna say, I thought it'd be fun to pull up a picture of Roger Sherman. So, because we don't have an image in our head. So I texted, oh, there he is. Wow, look at that. About that. That's a great photo because we all, you know, we have an image in our head of Washington and Adams and Jefferson, um, Franklin, but we don't really have an image in our head of, of him. You see how looks, serious he looks. He looks very serious and I guess reddish hair. Mm -hmm. Aubrey, you should see if you can find another image, but that's kind of a cool, look at that red suit. Looks like a red suit. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kathy, I don't want to hog your time. Did, did you say he was from, is he from Massachusetts? He was born in Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, April 19th, 1721. Interestingly, April 19th is the same day as Lexington and Concord. Um, but wow. uh, um, just, like, just like Adams and Jefferson dying on the same day. Two years later, he moved to uh, Connecticut, or his father moved him to Connecticut. Connecticut. Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, very good. You had said that. I just didn't catch it. All right, Kathy, here you go. 
Well, and speaking of, of pictures of Roger Sherman, Tom, I just keep admiring that very famous uh, John Trumbull painting over your shoulder. Oh, yeah, this one. Yes, yeah. and I think it, it does depict the, the five that you're talking about, uh, Franklin Adams, Jefferson, and then Livingston and Roger Sherman. And I was trying to figure out which one Roger Sherman is. Do you have tap it? Is he right yeah. behind Jefferson? So Adams, Sherman, Livingston, Jefferson, Franklin. And so he's the second one from the left. He's standing next to John Adams. Okay. Adams, Sherman, Livingston, Jefferson, Franklin. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. Um, then we had a Keith Rome, Romeling had asked, I understand that Roger Sherman served in Congress and on the Supreme Court of Connecticut during the Revolutionary War. As a Supreme Court judge, was it difficult and dangerous to render decisions and judgments? Do you know much about Sherman's service? Well, it, it was difficult. I, I don't know a lot about that. No, I apologize. Um, you know, the... Uh, you have to remember that uh, in, until you know, 1776, 77, you know, New England was really where most of the British troops were stationed. And, um, and, and so they were in close proximity to people that could imprison them for a decision they didn't like. Um, you know, the, the same thing with the meetings. Uh, and, and so, yes, it was dangerous. I can't speak to how dangerous it was. Okay. And Mary Multimer says yes to my fellow Connecticut, 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 I don't even, Connecticut, <laughs> Roger Sherman. So thank you, Mary. Um, and then Lauren Berg, Lorene Berg asks a question I think we already answered. Uh, did Sherman get along with Jefferson, Washington, mm -hmm. Adams, et cetera? Um, but she also is curious about the set of books behind you where the spines form Washington crossing the Delaware. Oh yes, this, this is one of my favorite series. Um, this uh, series was the Washington Irving series um, that was published in 1861. <clears throat> now these weren't, this is the reprint. Um, now I think this was put out uh, by Easton Press. There's a little promotion for Easton Press up in Connecticut. Um, but anyway, it's a great series. It's a, uh, it's interesting if you read Washington Irving's account, you know, you, you get a different, it's a different lingo, it's a different way of writing, it's a more, it's a, it's a deeper reverence for uh, Washington. I'd highly recommend it. It's, it's David McCullough and Meacham and these guys today, they write great. But um, to write closer to the time period in Washington live, I think if you read those books, you get a different feeling. It's, it's, it really stirs you up when you read it. Well, and so anyway, you can buy it from Easton Press, and it's the Washington Irving uh, series. Well, that's so is great. that what it's called, the Washington Irving series, or is there a title yeah. of the book? George, the wife of George uh, that's George Washington. So you it, it, are the others different uh, different people? Is each book a different, represent a different person? Nope, just different volumes. So five. Oh, they're all books. about George Washington. Well, Janine, he's a big guy. I mean, there's a lot of things to learn about. Come on. Wow. Well, I know, but Tom was in charge of our book study. We just did a 600 page book on Washington and now we're gonna have to go read five books on Washington. You know, Janine, the other, the other one I have, my other- Tova, that's books. our next book study. Go for it, Tova. I have uh, up on the top shelf, I have a six volume set, uh, first edition written by uh, Douglas Southall Freeman. Uh, 1948, I think it came out, and won the Pulitzer for uh, Washington. It's a six volume set. And that's also some in depth reading, Janine. So something else. Wow. Okay. I'm going to get it. I'm going to see. There start you go. Out. Why not? Christmas present. Christmas present for you. Yeah. Well, hey, that looks really good on the shelf lining up. That's a great <laughs> observation. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I try to read all the books I put out that look impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you just put out a book because it looks impressive. Okay, Kathy, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, we uh, uh, Wyatt Hensley, who is one of our We the Future contest winners, writes in, hey, Mr. Han, this is Wyatt Hensley. First, I want to thank you for sponsoring our trip to Washington, D.C. this year. It really means a lot to us. 
Uh, and then Wyatt says, given his background in law, did Sherman want to become a Supreme Court justice or did he believe he was better suited for Congress? That is a great question. You know, it's interesting. He, um, I don't know what he thought he was suited for, to be honest. <clears throat> He's not the kind of guy that, um, like John Adams wrote down so many things about what he wanted to do and, and that Sherman didn't do that. And so it's hard to know what he wanted to be. Um, it seemed like he went where he was called. Um, when he was called to be a Supreme Court judge, he said, yes, sir. <clears throat> when he was called to Congress, he said, yes, sir. And when he was called to do two things at the same time, which he was a couple of times, he always picked the one that better served the people. And so it was interesting. He had to do that. Uh, I think one time he was a judge and maybe a, a delegate. And he felt, no, I got to be the delegate because that's a bigger task. So he gave it the more lucrative, the lucrative job of being a judge to be the delegate. And so uh, um, anyway, yeah. That is, it is interesting how our founders so often were called to do more than one job at once. They were. And we were talking about that on, on Benjamin Rush and, and how stressful it really must have been. And, and mm -hmm. I always think of stress as sort of a modern day problem, but it, I think our founding fathers felt it quite acutely um, in their you know, time. I think, Kathy, <clears throat> these, um, these founders, they didn't view government as a job. It was a duty to perform. They were leading citizens. They went, they performed their duty. They went back home and they started working next alongside where they were before. I mean, it wasn't any different. Mm -hmm. uh, John Adams went back and was a farmer. Uh, you know, uh, whenever Roger Sherman went back home, he was an attorney. George Washington went home to Mount Vernon and, you know, he ran the plantation. I mean, that's, these guys, they weren't career politicians and that's, a big difference than what we have today. And you know, you wonder if there's something to that. Very much. I do. And I, I always brag about Texas and how Texas, they're every other year and they meet at the, leg, uh, the legislature meets every other year and they yep. only get meet for six months or something. Yep. And they only make about $75. Uh, yeah. I, I think we should do it. I think that Aubrey and Jill and Jordan and Tova and Kathy and I and you thought we should all start a petition for a new <laughs> amendment to the Constitution where we take the pay away from them in Washington, D.C. You should there have a you volunteer go, right? basis. Right. That's it. They won't want to be there anymore. OK, Kathy, go ahead. <laughs> Well, and Teresa Speak writes in, this has been so very interesting. What a great man. And, and thank you, Teresa, for being on. And our final question is, you know, Janine talks about how much we learn through doing these. I know I personally had never heard of the Articles of Association that came from the First Continental Congress in 1774. I, we always hear, we're, we learn about the Articles of Confederation, right. but never these uh, Articles of Association. Could you tell us just a little bit more about those in our last two minutes? Yeah, the Articles of Association, or also called the Continental Association, um, it was an effort uh, to uh, do something to show uh, England that we weren't going to take uh, uh, the, uh, the intolerable acts and other sorts of oppression uh, lightly. And it was a boycott on British goods uh, coming into America. And um, and also a boycott on things going out. And so we sacrificed, these, these wealthy people sacrificed a lot to make that happen. But that was the Articles of Association. It was really the first time <clears throat> that we were united <clears throat> as a people and, and, and sent out a, uh, you know, and, and did something, took a concerted action together. You know, we had met before the Stamp Act Congress, but we didn't really enact anything. But this, coming together, this, this uh, collaborative effort, if you will, the first time ever, all these 13 disparate colonies came together and said, you know what, we can do this together. And that's a big deal. We never talk about it, but that's, that is a big deal. Big deal. Well, thank you. Janine, I'm gonna hand it back over to you. Okay, well, I have, so, I have a surprise for you, Tom. Uh-oh. Guess who's here? Wyatt, say hi. Oh, hello. Hey, Wyatt. Do we get do we get to see your face, Wyatt? Um, I'm not seeing where I can uh do that. There, yeah, there's a video button at the top of your TV or something. I thought Mr. Ken, I, I'd like to see your face. 
Oh, since yeah. he's sponsoring it. Do you, do you, no? It's connecting. Live TV. Are you able yes. to see me now? But oh, hold I'm on. Oh, wait, wait, wait. There Mr. we go. Andrew. Hey, Wyatt. Hey. Hey, Wyatt. hey Wyatt, I want to thank you for uh, what you're doing. Uh, we can't wait to get you to uh, D.C., Oh yeah! And all the fun things you're going to do there, and uh, I'm looking forward to your uh, you're having a great experience in, in DC. Well, I just want to thank you for sponsoring it because that oh, yeah. does really mean a lot. I was very really, very thrilled when I was told that you were sponsoring us, and I heard that you had a website too, Americana, Americana Corner. Corner. Thank you. For, yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, appreciate the promo. Appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, it's um, but yeah, uh, you know, we got to invest in the future. You know, yeah, coming after us, and we got to invest in you guys and gals. Yep. Uh, fun, fun, fun. Okay, Wyatt, <laughs> thanks for for being a trooper. <laughs> and to Aubrey Glad I can make it. So for Aubrey for figuring out how to do that quickly, and you know, Tom Hand, I I, I want to remind everybody to to watch 1776, the musical. Okay. Tova and Jordan Wyatt Aubrey, you haven't yet, but you will. They all get them in their goodie bags. Tom, I promise you'll love it. You will, I will love it. Okay. Secondly, I encourage everyone to get all the books that Tom Hand has behind him there. So <laughs> read that. And I encourage everyone to go to AmericanaCorner.com and read all of Mr. Hand's fabulous articles that he writes. Thank and you. in closing, I just want to thank you. I know that I know everyone on the, uh, uh, the panel here wants to thank you personally too, but thank you for your service to our country through West Point Military Academies. My father's a graduate class. Right, Center. right, yeah. Your yeah, your service in, in, in the Army and, and what you're doing now and educating us about the past so that we can be better Americans in the future is, is truly a wonderful legacy, and I just want to thank you. Well, thank you. It's a labor of love. It really is. Labor of love. Yeah. Well, you're like one of the, you're like, you're like a great founding father. Serving <laughs> <your> <laughs> thank you. Sure. Okay, Jova, Jewel, Jorn, Aubrey, Kathy, everybody who wants to say, get, say your salutations. Well, thanks, thank everyone. You. Oh, go ahead, Jova. I just wanted to say thanks, everyone, for hopping on. Um, for those of you who are new, we do this every week for over a year on um, the same time, Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and I can't believe we've been doing this since March, since April of 2020. Um, so yay us. And thank you all who have been with us. And for those who just joined, we're so happy to have you. Yay us. I love that. Jewel and Jordan, well, I always cut you off when you're saying goodbye. <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> uh, not, just another great Tuesday. OK. All right. Thank Mr. you, Hayes. Aubrey. This is like good night, John Boy. This is yeah, like John right. Boy. <laughs> Okay, Aubrey Wyatt, Kathy, all right. So I also say, Aubrey, say, say something. Oh, I was just going to say thank you so much to Mr. Han for being on our show. You were a great guest and I really enjoyed it. Tons of uh, fun. Thank you. Yeah. Thank okay. You. And also I want to remind everyone, we, we have a great series. Come, Kathy knows too, but our next series after this one is going to be the Anti-Federalists, which I think was, is going to just be really, really intriguing at this point in our history. Very excited about that. And uh, oh, our movie night. It's going to be next Tuesday. What is that? The 29th next Tuesday? Somebody tell me quickly. Okay, it's the Tuesday night. I'm going to be hosting it. You can have an interactive conversation with me. Uh, Kathy will be there. I think, I think we're going to have a lot of our winners with us too. I haven't actually asked all the winners yet. Um, but we're, we're going to be playing PSAs and the movies of our winners and songs as well. And so it's, it's really going to be a fun movie night. It's about two and a half hours, three hours. You can come and go as you please. Um, it was going to be Tuesday night um, on uh, the 29th, and you can join at constitutingamerica.org, and uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to play it again throughout the weekend, but we thought we'd give our own little movie night for July 4th. <laughs> okay, I think we did it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. See you bye. next week. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks.